with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome to Move the Six presented by AARP. DJ and Bucky here. And Buck, this is a special coaches edition episode of the show today and I cannot wait to share with the folks what we've compiled. Well DJ, you and I have talked um, hours on hours about team building and what's the best way to build a championship team. So Look, the, the Move the Sticks staff got together. We put a list of names of coaches, successful coaches, that have put, like, great teams together. Dabo Sweeney, Urban Meyer, Lou Holtz joins us, uh, James Franklin, Brian Kelly, Matt Rule. So many great coaches sharing some nuggets on creating a culture that enables you to build a championship program. Yeah, we've talked to guys that have come in, inherited a pretty good culture, made it better. Guys that have inherited a terrible culture and taken it all the way uh, to the tippy top of the, their profession. So uh, we tried to see what we could learn and glean from these conversations. And I feel like what we've done on the episode today is we've really kind of mined and taken out the gold, you know, these, these little snippets of gold from all of these coaches. And we've kind of just put it all together. And I, I think you're going to really enjoy this episode, getting a chance to hear from all these different prominent voices in the coaching profession. Yeah, look, it, it, it's fascinating to me just the, the process of building a team. Some of these guys, as you talked about, are turnaround specialists, being able to take teams that were downtrodden and quickly get them up and running and competing at a championship level. Others had to sustain levels of success and try and find a way to get it to the next level. Regardless, they all have recipes and there's some common denominators, some common traits that they share that I think all of us can incorporate in whatever we do, whether it's coaching a team or even in our business lives. All right, well, let's not waste any time here. Let's jump right into this. And what a person to start with, the guy who's coming off a national championship last season is in the playoff again this year. Uh, here is Dabo Sweeney, head coach at Clemson, talking about culture. What is the culture down in Clemson? What is it about? What, what have you put in place to help young people grow and thrive? Uh, relationship, love. You know, we serve their heart, not their talent. Our program is about what's best for the players. And, you know, now sometimes what's best for the players, the players don't like. You know, there's an old saying that says, uh, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. And, uh, you know, we, we have relationship and we're, we, we have transparency and we communicate. Lots of trust and respect and communication. We've built a family atmosphere that's very real and genuine. It's not something you can fabricate. We talk about appreciation. We, we teach servant leadership. You know, nobody's better than anybody else. How can you brighten somebody's day? It comes down to not just the people involved, but the intentions of the people involved. And, uh, you know, it's about graduating our players and equipping them with the tools that they need to be successful on and off the field. Uh, it's about making sure they have a great experience and that they win, but it's in that order. The guys know we're consistent and we're fair and the best player plays, period. You're not entitled is as you build a culture, don't base it on entitlement. Don't base it on what guys did last year. Base it on today, you know, and, and having that windshield mentality of it's always about what's next. You know, we learn and grow from what's in the rearview mirror, but there's a reason why that rearview mirror is small and that windshield is big. I start over every year and I, you know, I tell Trevor, hey, you were great last year. Awesome. You're going to have to earn the job again. All right. Because that's just the way it is. And, and that's just, you know, that's our culture. And guys buy into that and it creates competition and it stamps out complacency. I've always told our team, we're going to change Clemson, but we're going to do it from the inside out. We cannot be distracted by things we don't control, all right, or things we've never done, or things people say we can't do. If we're going to change it, it's going to be from the inside out. And if we stay focused that way, you know, and have the right belief, as a man thinks, so is he, and have a clear vision, then we will blossom on the outside. And uh, that's exactly what's happened with our program. Focus on having a great program. You know, don't focus on just having a great team. So many people, they compromise and they take shortcuts to have a great team. I don't sign JUCO players or transfers. Because you know, my mindset is I want to develop through the draft. I don't want to be lazy in evaluation. 
I'm gonna, we're gonna create a lot of accountability in recruiting. We're gonna, we're gonna evaluate well and we're gonna develop well. And I want, I want to build a culture that guys know if they put the work in, sooner or later they're gonna have an opportunity. Now the best player is gonna play, but, but you know, most time if you put the work in and you stick it out, sooner or later you're gonna have an opportunity. I mean, I just love them. I love what I do. I love where I am. I love my players. I've got three sons. I look at all these guys as my sons. I've been a player. Um, I understand how hard it is, but I want my my whole philosophy of coaching is is I care more about the 30 year old version of them than I do the 18 to 22 year old version of them. That's how I want to deal with them. You think differently at 30 than you did at 20. I just try to. Uh, lead with love and lead with wisdom. You know, I'm tough on these guys now. Yeah, I'm tough on them, uh, but they know I care. <laughs> they know that. Well, Buck, you got a chance to listen to Dabo there. I, th I thought it's fascinating when, when he discussed the whole junior college thing. Not that there's anything wrong with junior college players, mm -hmm. but they have a formula. They have a way they want to do things. They want to bring guys in as freshmen. They want to develop them and basically give them the promise. If you will put in the work, you've got the talent, uh, that eventually your time will come and you'll get your way out of the football field. Yeah, I think that was the best thing about what uh, Dabo talked about, his, his ability to really put the players first, make it about the players, develop the players, not only on the field, but develop them off the field, get them to be great men, great young people, great people in the community, and then that success will eventually translate to on-field success. But he talked about best players playing, letting guys compete, letting guys earn their way, uh, wiping away the entitlement. That's how you create a culture that allows you to compete each and every year for the national title. Yeah, being fair. I thought that was a, the key point there he made, being fair with his players. All right, for somebody who's won a couple national championships to somebody else who's won a couple national championships, Urban Meyer, he's done it at Florida. He's done it at Ohio State. Building championship programs, you're going to enjoy what he has to say. When you think about building a championship culture, what does that entail? Well, it's a lot of work. It's something that I think is one of the most overused words in the English language. I don't think people understand it. To say that I really did, I did not uh, as a young coach. And I think culture is everything. Culture to me is what does your product or what does your team, what does your organization look like? What does it feel like? And what does it act like? And not necessarily when you're winning by 40 points against FAU, it's what's it look like in a rivalry game? What's it look like and feel like and act like on fourth down and two? So I think that's one of the reasons why Ohio State is so successful. We built a culture that survives adversity, that survives uh, early entry in the NFL draft, a coaching change. You look at the Patriots and you can say, boy, they got a great coach. They got a great, you know, great players. Absolutely, that's true. But name someone who doesn't have a great coach and a great player in the NFL. They're all great. The thing that makes the New England Patriots unique is their culture developed by Bill Belichick, survives transition of players, survives injuries, and it's culture. The culture has to be yours. First of all, respect what was there before. You know, the culture at Ohio State we built, it's built on objective truths. It's built on history. It's built on experience. Then you have to sell it. Back when I played, your coach said, do something, you did it. Not now, you have to sell it. The culture at Ohio State, I always had a vision and a dream that we would play fearless. And I've worked at so many places where the players were scared to make mistakes. And so my first part, we have three parts of the culture. And number one is, for, it's uh, called relentless effort. You go as hard as you can. If you make a mistake, no problem. You know, I've been criticized. Some of our teams have had penalties over the years. And I would be okay with penalties, as long as it was non-effort related. Now, stupid penalties I had a problem with. But if you're going to go as hard as you can, you can't say, but don't make any mistakes. Because then a uh, player's in conflict. The number two is called competitive excellence. We're going to work harder than anybody else in America. And I don't want you to complain about it. I don't want you to worry about it. You know, I tell them in recruiting that you are going to be rewarded in the NFL most likely, and we're going to win. Just do what we ask you to do. It's going to be the most miserable, hard stuff you've ever done. But embrace it. And then the final piece is it's called power of the unit. And the greatest form of, I use the word inspiration instead of motivation, because motivation is short-lived. Inspiration is long lived and sustains, and it's love. The greatest form of motivation is the brotherhood. And the best teams and the best units are those that love each other and care about each other. So that's the culture of Ohio State. Well, Buck, I, I thought what, what Coach Meyer talked about there, being able to survive adversity. To me, any championship level team or organization, 
you're going to have some rocky times and how do you get through it as a group and stay together, not splinter. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, I thought it was fascinating. I think what's really fascinating about Coach Meyer is his ability to win and win and win and try and really figure out the problems. He talked about toughness being a big part of it. And I just think uh, the common denominator that we'll continue to hear uh, from all these coaches toughness how tough your team is how resilient they are how they bounce back from bad moments uh urban meyer understands in, in building the culture you have to have guys that will fight to the end and fight over those uh fight through those obstacles i think he understands that that's why the culture had been so great each and every place that he's been at yeah we talk about culture a lot of that is about relationships uh, and that's a topic that James Franklin, the head coach at Penn State, uh, did a wonderful job of describing the importance of making sure you're developing those relationships. How do you know what things are able to be carried over? And how do you know where you need to kind of create not new traditions, but you need to do new things that are very specific to the school where you're at, like a Penn State? Well, to me, that's where like your core values, that, that's where they are critical. That's where, you know, your, your mission statement is critical. That's where your overall, you know, your overall philosophy is critical. So like for me, it sounds very simplistic, but my philosophy is everything starts and ends with relationships. So, you know, every decision you make within that organization, in that building, it better be something that builds and strengthens relationships between individuals, but also within the team. That's holding people accountable. That's all those types of things. Um, so my point is, is those big picture common themes that are critical in any organization, in any environment, those don't change. Um, but your point is a good one. Uh, understanding what that university is like what things do carry over from a Vanderbilt that makes sense at a place like Penn State and what don't. You know, me going to Vanderbilt and walking around the union and try to convince students to not go home for Thanksgiving break and to stay for the Tennessee game, I don't need to do that at Penn State. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, a little different. <laughs> <laughs> a little different model, a little different model from that perspective. And, you know, it did take some adjustment because uh, less of that was needed. But um, but I just think being able to identify those things, here's the critical things that are never going to change. Your core values, your core beliefs, um, and then all these other things, it's got to be built. So I think one of the things you have to do is whatever you're talking about in your program, you know, whether they're core values or whether they're, um, you know, your overall philosophy, you can't assume that people know what those things are. Um, for me, you know, um, it's making sure that the players understand, number one, that you care. It's got to start with relationships, um, building that trust and the relationships with the players, because I believe once you have that, you have the ability to take the program and the kids to a level that they're probably not able to do on their own. Why? Because you can be really challenging and demanding on people if they know it's coming from a place where you're doing this because you care about them and you care about the program. And when you have that trust and you have that respect and those types of relationships, then you can really do some significant things, not only as a team, but, but also individually. Um, so it starts with that. It starts with trust. Well, Buck, I don't know if anybody really inherited a tougher situation than James Franklin there at Penn State. This is a, a program with a, lot, a rich history, but had been through a, a very serious scandal, a lot of changeover in the coaches, uh, people in and out, and then to, to get that program back up on its feet and to stabilize it to where they are playing at a really a top 10, top 15 caliber program year in and year out, uh, he's doing something right. He absolutely is doing something right, and, and I think, look, it boils down to trust and communication. Uh, can you have direct, honest communication with your players? Can you build that trust and sustain that trust by having those direct communications? James Franklin has done it. He's done it at a couple of different places. Did it at Vanderbilt. He's done it at Penn State. Terrific coach. And you can see why his players like playing for him. Well, I also enjoy when, when coaches really just climb their way up the ladder. James Franklin proved he could do it at Vanderbilt. That afforded him the opportunity to go to Penn State. But maybe the best example of, of having a program and something that works and just kind of climbing up the ladder, uh, you got to go to Notre Dame for that, and Brian Kelly, and you'll enjoy his our conversation with him about building and developing a program. 
But I want to go in the time machine a little bit and go back to your time and your start there at Grand Valley and, and all the success yeah. that you had there. Is, is, or is that really the base and the foundation for the same things you're doing at Notre Dame? Well, certainly that that's where I began my career. And I think, you know, as a, a young head coach, you learn and you make mistakes and, and that helps build the foundation for a lot of the things that, that I'm doing today. Look, you know, Daniel, I, I mean, I learned how to do the laundry there. And, and when you have to do all the jobs um, from uh, getting the buses uh, to making sure the laundry's done, literally, um, you have a sense for how to develop and build a program because you know all the other jobs. And that, that serves you well when you come to a place like Notre Dame. Coach, it's funny because I'm a first-time head coach this year, and I'm doing laundry, and I'm doing all those things <laughs> or whatever. So because you've been able to turn around a couple different programs, um, what is the secret sauce to being able to take a program that may be down when you inherit it and get it up and rolling when it becomes – to get it to a, a competitive level? Well, I think first you have to start with what your mission is. I mean, clearly define – to everybody that's in that room. And I don't mean just the players. I mean, the guy that is sweeping out the room after. I mean, everybody that's in that building, everybody that touches the program, clearly define what the mission is. And I think once you lay down that mission, uh, it then becomes uh, painting the vision for that. And so uh, everywhere that I've been, it's been a clear mission, vision, and then for me, uh, communicating that on a day-to-day -day basis and at times over communicating it, uh, making sure that there is no um, uh, you know, miscommunication as to why we're here. So um, I think once you kind of you know, narrow down what it is that you're after, uh, communicating that mission and vision, it starts there and then it's a day-to-day -day process um, every single day after that. Well, Buck, I remember going back in and visiting at Grand Valley. That was one of my first visits as a scout going in there and realizing, okay, there's something special and unique about this place, the culture they've created. All they did was win, and then you saw the opportunities grow there for Brian Kelly, then going on to Cincinnati, then on to, uh, to Notre Dame. Uh, he's been a, a tremendous success with some of the limitations they have there at Notre Dame. He's kept them relevant year in and year out. He has kept them relevant, and I think his, his ability to kind of take the formula and the recipe and take it from Grand Valley State to Central Michigan to Cincinnati and then to Notre Dame says that he understands what it takes, and he can spot it and identify it, and he's also quick to change it when the culture isn't right. It's really a testament to him and all the success that he's had that he really understands how to build a consistent winner. Somebody else that understands how to build a consistent winner is, is someone I'm very familiar with. I uh, haven't been coached by him. Scott Satterfield was a position coach at App State when I was playing there. Went on to become the head coach at Appalachian State. Then left this past year, went to Louisville, and orchestrated one of the best turnarounds in college football we've seen in a decade plus. Uh, earned himself the ACC Coach of the Year. And we had a chance to sit down and talk with him about that culture. You look at the, the culture that we both know so well coming out, out of App State, and you've spent, what, 20 years there at that program. When I, I think if you talk to anybody, as I know you have, around the country, they're jealous of the culture that exists at App State. It's a family culture. Uh, what, what are the first you know, two or three steps when you get to a new place to try and get that started at a new program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for us, the first thing that we did was try to build trust within the program and within our players. Um, you know, I've said this before, the players really didn't – know where the head coach's office was here. They really didn't spend a lot of time around the coaches. And so for us, that's always been a norm. And and we wanted them to be able to come up here and spend time with us in our offices. Um, so, but the building trust, and I think that just throughout being consistent on a daily basis, um, you know, caring about the players, caring about, you know, not only football, but what's going on in their lives, um, you know, back home or school or, you know, whatever else. And I think just doing that on a, on a daily basis is, is how we started that. And we've been that, that way for the last eight months. Um, and I think the players have come to accustomed to it now and they really appreciate it and they're, they're loving what we're doing here. Um, you know, but I think that's the key word is being consistent, you know, not being high, you know, too high or too low, and but just being consistent with our approach. Buck, I, I thought the ability for Coach Satterfield to translate what worked and what they built at Appalachian State 
and bring that to Louisville, you know, with uh, allowing those guys to be themselves. But there's some some hardcore philosophies they believe in, and it traveled. It traveled well from Boone, North Carolina, to Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, it did travel well, and I think he deserves a, a ton of credit. He was well deserving of being named ACC Coach of the Year for being able to uh, take those core values and drop them in at Louisville while also allowing the players uh, to kind of re- maintain their, their own identity and some of the things that they had created there. Um, I think that's a sign of a great coach. A great coach is, is able to kind of dig in the toolbox and pick which tool is right for every situation. Satterfield talks about that. It's one of the reasons why he's one of the best coaches in college football. Well, he's been outstanding there. And somebody else, you talk about turnarounds, even maybe more impressive than that. I I think everybody would agree. Uh, Matt Rule, the job he did at Baylor, taking over a program that had been through scandal and was in a very low place uh, to struggle early on, but then to be within one play of the college football playoff this last year, a remarkable turnaround for Matt Rule. And after this conversation, I think you'll learn and discover why he's a hot name with NFL teams. I distinctly remember you talking about speed, um, saying that, look, we're going out, we're trying to find guys with track background, we're trying to find guys that can really run. We need to make this football team faster. We'll develop them when we get them on campus, but that is one area that you focused on. Uh, and, man, it seems like at this point in time you're starting to see that really pay off. Your, your football team's so much faster now than when you got there. Yeah, you know, we, um, we, we made a decision a long, long time ago to be just kind of really numbers-based. Um, you know, you can you can just go get a bunch of really good football players, and there, there's there's a place for that. Uh, but but for us, you know, we don't really have first pick in recruiting. You know, we're not uh, the blue blood school that you know takes all the five star kids. And so, you know, we're going to find kids with length. We're going to find kids with size. We're going to find kids who 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 can run, who can jump, and and feel like our profit, our, our process, our work ethic, our weight room, our coaching staff, they'll they'll develop the football part of it. So. It doesn't work all the time, but, you know, you look out there for us and you see a bunch of kids that run 10-2, 10-3, 10-4, you know, and maybe they were a receiver in high school, now they're a corner. Maybe they were a corner, now they're a safety. But you see a lot of speed across the board. You see former receivers playing linebacker. And so um, it, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not the easy way to do it, but I think if you do it right, you can have a really fast team, a really explosive team, and get guys in the right spots. Coach, going through the, the draft process and you're evaluating these guys, you're always trying to find you know the different traits. We can all see the physical stuff. That's easy to spot on the tape. Um, but trying to find the makeup of kids. And we were talking to Dabo uh, last week, and we had kind of posed this question to him. He used the word focus over and over again, just with all the distractions we have in the world today, especially with these young kids. The guys that are really focused, that that, that is a huge deal. Is there? Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And is there another trait? Is there something else that you see, you know, that the guys that have been successful in your program have in common? Yeah, I think focus is a great word, and, and I think you have to find guys that come from pro- programs that require them to focus. I think it comes down to really two things to me. It comes down to maturity. You know, a lot of kids are really good kids. You just have to kind of wait for them to grow up. And a lot of that to me is adversity. Former walk-ons in the NFL, uh, you know, f- guys who right have on. changed positions, guys who have redshirted. You know, a lot of guys are five-star recruits, four-star recruits. They go in, they play three years and they leave and they haven't really had, a, they might've had off the field adversity, but they haven't had a lot of football adversity because you only football character when you have football adversity. When you're when things are going well, everyone's good. When things, you know, hit the fan is when you need to truly love the game. And to me, when you get guys who have red shirted, who have changed positions, who have walked on, you know that they have gone through that period and had to fight through it. And so I think that maturity, that love of the game is what everyone's dying for at the next level. Buck, I, I thought Coach Rule talking about, you know, how to build the program, mm-hmm. talking about speed, that was important. But just a, a toughness that they had there, and I think that's what this football program has really been all about there at Baylor. Yeah, it all, it's all about the toughness and how you have to coach up the toughness, how you have to man more uh, from your young players, and they ultimately will respond. I also thought the recruiting model was fascinating, not being at a premier school or a blue blood, but finding different ways to tap into uh, – the great recruiting market and then to develop the players it's all a part of building a championship team the culture has to be about the toughness but then developing those players so they can play at a high level Baylor has done it better than most I thought he he echoed also what Coach Meyer said a little bit earlier, which is got to be able to deal with adversity and football adversity in the middle of a game. How do you deal with that? Um, I thought that was really fascinating to listen to. All right, we got a chance to to listen to Coach Satterfield a few minutes ago, who uh, coached me in college. Now we get a chance to listen to your college football head coach, Mac Brown, who's won a national championship at Texas. 
He returned to North Carolina and has, has that program uh, well on their way to being back to what they were when he was there the first time. And it was great to catch up with Coach Brown about how he builds his culture. When you think about that word culture, what does it mean when it comes to building your program and how important is it to have the culture right before you really can win at a big level? Bucky, I think the, the biggest thing is that people use the word culture all the time. I've never used it much, but I, I think you are who you are. And the first thing that has to happen with our assistant coaches, our staff, and our team is they have to know that I'm going to be honest with them. So whatever I tell them, I'm going to do. And if they don't have that trust, then it, it just doesn't work. So first thing we did is we came in and said, okay, Bucky, you've been losing. Why? Tell me why you're losing. Tell me what needs to change. Secondly, what, what do you want? What do you need? Well, the food's bad. We'll fix the food. So now we got great food and that looks good. The player's lounge. Why don't you go in the player's lounge? There's nothing in there we like. Here, here pad and pencil. Write down what you like. What do you want? I want this video game. Okay, we'll get it. I want a bigger pop a shot. I want two of them. Great, we'll get them, we'll sleep pods, we'll get it, whatever you want. <laughs> but you gotta come in there and use it because we want you around here, we want you to believe in us. Uh, the, the, the field has been bad for the last couple of years. We'll put field turf in, we'll put synthetic grass, and that will be faster than other people. And that, that's going, it's gonna look good. Number one, you gotta commit to them. Number two, you've gotta to give them what they want within the rules and make sure that they understand that the program is special. It's not just, uh, we're, we're not asking you to do special things, but not giving you special things to do those things. And, and then thirdly, they need to know that if I tell them uh, they're gonna have steak on Friday night and steak doesn't show up, then I'm not doing my job. So whatever you tell these young people, they need to know that you're gonna follow it up. And, and again, we all talk about little things, little things like trust are huge. And without that, it, it just doesn't work. So I, I've become, DJ, another thing about the five years, I've become so direct with our yeah. staff and our assistant coaches. I've, I've become so direct with our team. I tell them exactly what I think. And, and, I, and I've told them, you, if you don't want to hear the truth, then grow up. Well, Buck, there's a, there's a life uh, and an energy to Coach Mac Brown when you talk to him. I don't know. I don't care what the birth certificate says. That man is young at heart, and he's very excited about what he's getting a chance to rebuild there at North Carolina. Yeah, he's doing a great job of rebuilding uh, the program at North Carolina. And I think uh, just in those snippets, you understand why. It's always about the players. He wants to do whatever he can do to make sure that the players are comfortable, that they have everything that they need to have success. And then he's going to make sure that he coaches them, he gets them going. And so – when you look at a guy who has been able to do it at North Carolina, then he did it at Texas, now he's back at North Carolina, he obviously has the recipe for success. Uh, I'm just glad he was able to share a little insight. Well, the interesting thing is when we talk to, to coaches like Mac Brown and, and Urban Meyer, um, Scott Satterfield, Matt Rowe, all these guys, James Franklin, there, there's one name. When you talk about coaches that they admire or coaches that they paid attention to or that they've learned from, a name kept coming up over and over again as we were going through all these coaching conversations, and we said, you know what, we've got to get this guy on. And fortunately, we were able to get it done. Lou Holtz, a legendary coach at Notre Dame, uh, had a chance to visit with him, Buck, and we we quickly learned the secret sauce of why Lou Holtz had so much success. Choosing to take over downtrodden programs. I happen to see your, your story about taking over South Carolina and how the struggles were early and how you were resolute in bringing it back. When you've been successful at previous places and it takes a little longer to turn it around, how are you able to still dig down deep and continue to believe in the values that you believe in? I think that if you're willing to want to do something bad enough, you'll find a way. If you want to achieve something, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. Excuse is a lot easier to find than solution. I also think it's important to make sure that you never sacrifice, uh, uh, make a short range decision that will sacrifice your long range goal. For example, maybe I had to suspend some athletes at Arkansas my first year, but that, that was more critical because if you don't, you're going to establish a culture that is not going to be conducive to making good young men as well as good football players. I never felt I coached football. I felt I coached life. This game's not determined by a computer. Height, weight, size, speed, if it was, we'd put it in the computer and we'd get a readout. 
The game of football is determined by who wants to win. Well, Buck, to me, no excuses. I mean, that was that was the mantra there for mm -hmm. Lou Holtz. Just doesn't allow it. You don't make excuses. You find a way to get it done. You get it done. Um, and he's still sharp, man. I, I know he's he's been out of it for a while, but you can definitely tell in that conversation he's still got it. Yeah, he still has it. Find a way to win is everything. Like, no excuses. Find a way to overcome whatever is in front of you. And don't worry about what it looks like. And I think the perseverance, the grit, the resiliency uh, that he discusses, uh, that might be the best trait that every player and every team must have if they're going to get to the top of the mountain. I, I, I just believe that Lou Holtz inspires so many coaches and so many coaches that follow this thing. It was great to have him on because you hear the wisdom in his words. Look, it, it, it stands the test of time. Yeah, no doubt. What a great way to end this episode, listening to what Coach Lou Holtz had to say. I hope you guys have enjoyed this as much as we have these conversations with these championship caliber coaches and how they've built their cultures and what makes them tick. It's been fascinating for us to learn as we go along, and hopefully you enjoyed it as well. Uh, well that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for watching, for listening. For Bucky Brooks, I'm Daniel Jeremiah. Thanks for listening to Move the Sticks, presented by AARP.